yep, I think this is going to work. Well, I hope it is, otherwise we will change the scenery, <laughs> maybe to something more pleasant as a backdrop. Welcome to a care collab of Eonoxus Popcorn Haruri, together with Danielle's Orchid Ranch and Karin's Orchids. So, yes, we've got her back in bloom, this little cutie. And I'm really grateful to Danielle's Orchid Ranch and Karin's Orchids for joining me on this care collab. I've got the links to their channels in the description below, and I will update those links to the actual video link of the care collab once I see their videos. So here we are. Goodness me, what a time I've had with this orchid. How do I take care of her? Well, you can see that I have an unconventional mount. Everything is inorganic. I used to have her mounted just on what used to be a placemat of a table. And then I had moss around her, which I changed every six months of the year just to keep it fresh and not get those fine roots to decline because the moss is going over and is going acidic. That being said, I live in southern Spain, so for about six to eight months of the year, I am having to water this orchid a lot. And that's why the moss was just not convenient for me anymore. When it comes to mounting orchids, the idea is to just leave them alone, let them get on with it, stop disturbing the roots. Well, watering the amount that I had to water, the moss was just deteriorating too fast and it was disturbing the roots every single time I had to re-moss. So we came up with something else. Michael McCarthy came up with the scrubby pad as opposed to EpiWeb. And I thought, yep, that's gonna work because a fine root system with the dense material of the scrubby pad, perfect. They can find their way through without any issues at all. So there's that, that worked. But then I mounted her with the scrubby pad in the back as my humidity buffer. I have an extremely dry climate, so the scrubby pad acted as my humidity buffer. And I still put sphagnum moss down the side to hydrate roots as they were coming out of the new growth, which worked really well as well. But again, I'm using sphagnum moss. I had to change that thought process. And then we moved into the inert media of a fabulous material, hob material, the extractor fan filter, which is a little bit more softer in its texture and more forgiving than the more dense scrubby pad. And you can manipulate it. And so I made a little bit of a ball kind of thing. And you can see that all this used to be moss. It is now extractor fan material and it is working a treat. This little orchid, there's two pieces on here, which I mounted then on uh, last year to get everything freshened up, fell into two pieces, and she has come on in leaps and bounds. So the principle of scrubby pad, plus a little bit more like a full sphagnum moss pocket here to the left, works beautifully. And there's growth still coming out, and we are now in mid-August. Whether they will bloom, I don't know. It doesn't matter, but it's just gone nuts on this mount in the past year. I'm absolutely loving it. And you know, it's so easy to take care of, especially now in the summer, because all I have to do is just go in with my RO water and just mist that area that is supposedly sphagnum moss. And if I am then in the winter, a little bit more cautious for anything going into the little growths and the joints, I water the back of the mount. This way, the roots that are in the scrubby pad, <laughs> they get water and I'm not affecting anything around the front. No joints, no little tight leaf nodes, nothing gets affected at all. And you can see it staring us into the face. My first spike, I have another one coming up there. It's already budding out. Didn't bloom in time, but we'll see it in other videos. But this is a popcorn haruri. This is a sheer delight. The thing about this is, and I'm glad that it's facing this way right now, so I'll get into that right now, the different colors that it has. When the blooms just open, they're this beautiful little canary yellow with little pink spots. As they age, they fade into a baby yellow and the skirt around the lip starts to go into pink. And then you get pink striations and the yellow fades even more. 
and as the bloom ages, it gets pink all together on the lips. So you can see the different stages and maturity of the bloom. She is not fragrant, but she is so charming. And she lasts about three weeks on a bloom spike, sometimes a little bit more depending on the weather. But so far, these blooms, when they opened, they've held on pretty well, considering the dry conditions we've already had. I'm glad the spike did not frazzle and cook because it is a delicate structure. There's not that much to it. So hot winds, high temperatures, and yet it still made it. So I'm really, really pleased. I've got blooms to show for a care collab because they are just so charming. I fertilize her at 100 parts per million every single day, maybe twice a day, if I don't have as much humidity in the air. So I can spray her at 8 a.m. and then once again around 11 or 12 with fertilized water of 100 parts per million prior to the water evaporating. I just have to be really careful that when I do fertilize her that I'm right on top of it at around maybe one o'clock when I go around with my plain RO water and then I spray her down heavily again to pretty much flush out any excess salt that could be in this material because I don't want that to accumulate. The idea being that this orchid is now not going to be disturbed. I have no organic media on her at all. I don't want the salts to accumulate and I'm very, very conservative with regards to the fertilizer at 100 parts per million. I was a bit concerned about some deficiencies showing, so I have given her a little bit of Epsom salts. In the meantime, also at 100 parts per million, but I don't want to focus that on that too much because at the end of the day, if she needs more fertilizer, then I can be a little bit more aggressive with regards to fertilizing every day, maybe twice a day, depending on the weather. But as far as I can see, she is just rocking it on that mount and I'm so, I can't tell you the relief of not having to touch any more sphagnum moss. <laughs> but let's go to the winter care. As I showed you, the watering is so much more simplified. I can come at her from behind, <laughs> literally, and water whatever roots are in the scrubby pad in the background. And I never ever encroach on any of the, what's going on at the front. Now in the summer, it's not a problem if I am a bit heavy handed because she lives in my blooming alley up against the glass wall facing south. That's a very breezy area. As I mentioned, I'm concerned about frazzling very delicate spike structures, but the fact that it's so breezy, if I go at her with my sprayer, I am not concerned about losing tiny little growths if water were to go in there. So that is her home from, from April through to November, or let's say until the night temperatures drop to about 13 degrees Celsius. When those night temperatures start, then I'm a little bit more cautious and I do bring her in to protect her. I do not want to lose this orchid. Now that we've gotten her, finally gotten her to be happy, and I can stop messing around and let her get on with it. So my night lows will have to be 13 degrees. Anything lower than that, my goodness, I'm bringing her in. And then she hangs on a little rack facing away from some shop lights where she gets a lot of light, but it's not directed at her. In the winter, she really doesn't do that much. I mean, I stop fertilizing in the winter altogether because any growths that come, eh, it's not exactly her ideal growing momentum then. So there is no fertilizer going on whatsoever, but I do mist her regularly. Right now, I hardly need to use seaweed as well. She's got the mojo, she's chugging along. I used to use quite a bit of seaweed to encourage more root growth, but right now, I don't need to do that anymore. It's 100 parts per million of fertilizer, and that nutrient solution is then pH'd at 6.3, which gives me a pretty good balance of every element in that solution for her to absorb. Again, as I mentioned, I think that there was magnesium deficiency. Instead of changing the pH in my bucket for watering purposes, I just apply a separate doses of Epsom salts ever so often and I hope it will correct itself. It won't correct itself on the older growths. I'm sure of that. These are the growths that she came with when she was itty bitty. And you can see the other older growth is up here where she divided herself when I was trying to mount her again. But the other ones, I believe there was a bit of scale in here, so I went after them with my paintbrush. 
This is not a scale thing. This is something else, but I don't know why it's still there. I can't get it off. Maybe it's pitting from scale. I'm not sure. Normally my scale makes the leaf look like a rounded damage like that. So, but whatever it is, it's not there anymore. So I do keep a close eye on her if she is prone to scale because that's not happening. We've got her this far and the rest is now just fill that mount and go where you need to go. And there is no way I'm going to have a pest take her out. So she gets a lot of light, but only direct sun during the winter when the angle of the sun lowers itself in the sky. And then the wall where she is living, that will get sun. And I do bring her outside on the sunny days, even if the temperatures are only 17 degrees. If it's sunny, she goes outside. I try to avoid having any artificial lights on when I have the gorgeous natural sunshine outdoors that they can take advantage of. So I do bring her outside when the temperatures are nice and it is sunny. But that is the winter sun. It is weak and it is sort of tucked away and protected from a trellis. It doesn't come at her full on. And in the summer, she is just in bright, bright shade. I've been yapping away. I just hope that all the blooms were in focus. There's a little bit of a blustery breeze around. And I can see that she was bopping around. They are so cute. I love how the color does change. I think that is all the charm of this beautiful little Oncidium hybrid Eonopsis popcorn Haruri. There are other popcorns out there, I just haven't found them yet. But if I can get another variety of popcorn, I would be happy to have it now that I can see that I know what I'm doing. <clears throat> I hope this was helpful if you came here to search for an Eonopsis popcorn Haruri, how to take care of it. My method is somewhat unconventional, I understand that. If you have any questions regarding the materials I've used, I've got a playlist, Evolution of Inorganic Mount, so I'm going to attach that link in the description. But anything else, if I can answer it very quickly in the comments, please feel free to ask away. Thank you once again to Daniel's Orchid Ranch and Karen's Orchids. Busy ladies, you taking time out of your busy schedules to join me on a care collab for Eonopsis Popcorn Haruri is very, very much appreciated as is the time of everybody that has come, clicked on the video and watched it. Thank you so much. Have yourselves a wonderful day. Please stay safe and take care. Bye.